I will be presenting today on starting a small business in San Francisco specifically. So uh, I'm Marta Yanez with the Office of Small Business. We are a city and county of San Francisco government agency, and we are located inside City Hall. We're really set up to help people who want to start a business in San Francisco specifically. Um, being that we are a city and county of San Francisco government agency, we are really able to assist you with the local San Francisco specific requirements. Um, we like to consider ourselves the first place for you to come to get information on starting a small business in the city. Or we also um, assist people who already have businesses and operating in San Francisco with whatever their needs are, whether they are looking to expand and grow, hire employees, um, need loan financing, seeking business programs. We like to consider ourselves the first place that all um, people should come to or contact uh, with all things small business in San Francisco. I did pre uh, prepare a presentation, which I will share in a moment, but just to kind of give you a little bit more background, which isn't included in the slides, um, our office was created uh, back in 2008, I believe, um, and it was created out of a need for uh, the city to provide assistance and resources to small businesses. At the time, the city was passing local laws that were going to ultimately impact small businesses that operate in San Francisco, uh, many uh, having to do with employees and having employees. So if you are a small business that will have employees in San Francisco, you need to be aware that there are um, some employer mandates that are um, actually were unique originally when they uh, were implemented back in 2008 to San Francisco, since then the state and the federal government have adopted similar laws. Um, but at the time, um, the city was really putting a lot on the backs of small businesses. And so there was an idea to create an office and assistance center um, to serve small businesses, small businesses. So we define small business as less than 100 employees. So really that makes up over, I would say 90% of our business community in San Francisco. So it's small by our de by that definition. Um, and so again, at the time back in 2008, the city was getting ready to pass um, the paid sick leave ordinance. So before the state uh, created a paid sick leave ordinance, the city was proposing one, and that requires that if you have even one employee, that you're uh, required to provide paid time off to that employee in case they're sick or need to stay home with a, a sick child, et cetera. Um, at the time, there was also another proposal. Um, the well before Obamacare, the city was already at the time also discussing um, a mandate or a law to require employers to provide health coverage to their employees, and that was going to apply once you have 20 or more employees. Um, and then the minimum wage in San Francisco has always been higher than the nation's minimum wage. So again, if you are someone who's opening up a business in San Francisco, particularly if you're going to have employees, uh, there was the um, belief at that time that we needed a place for small businesses to come and get assistance, uh, find out about programs, et cetera. So that's kind of how our office was created back in 2008. We are located inside City Hall. So I think now I will um, go ahead and start sharing my screen. <clears throat> I will. I will say that um, this presentation is packed with lots of information. Um, if you take anything away from this presentation and PowerPoint, definitely take down our contact information because we uh, want you to contact us. Again, this is a lot of information that I'm going to cover today. So um, feel free to, if it's too much or it goes too fast, um, definitely just follow up with us. Uh, by calling our main line or my contact info is on the presentation slides as well. My direct number, my email, feel free to stay in touch with us. We like to make ourselves really uh, accessible and available to you. So do not hesitate to reach out after this or at any point um, going forward. So with that, I will start sharing my screen. Um, and then again, we'll take questions at the end. So hopefully you guys can all see my slide deck yes. here. Yes. Um, starting a business in San Francisco, Small Business Week 2023, presented by the San Francisco Office of Small Business and myself, Marta Yanez. So this is just a little bit of information about us and who we are. Again, 
We are San Francisco City Government Agency. We're under the Office of Economic and Workforce Development of the city. And we're also overseen by the San Francisco Small Business Commission. Uh, the San Francisco Small Business Commission, just a little bit about them, they are a seven member body. They are appointed by um, these folks that serve on the commission. They are either small business uh, owners themselves or somehow work with small businesses here in the city. They are appointed by the mayor and the board of supervisors and they meet regularly at city hall to review um, policy and law um, that might ultimately impact small businesses that operate here. So like back in 2008, when the city was getting prepared to pass the paid sick leave ordinance and the healthcare security ordinance and raising the minimum wage, all of those are decisions that are being made at City Hall. And ultimately, if you're going to be a business that operates in San Francisco, we want to make sure that you are engaged in those conversations or know that you can be um, engaged in those conversations so you can tune in to our commission meetings. You can uh, find that information about when the commission meets on our website, and I'll share our website with you later. Um, you can see the agenda and kind of see what's being discussed and determine whether it's something that you want to participate in that conversation. You can uh, participate in those conversations by either, again, attending the meetings, uh, calling in, emailing, sending letters, um, however way you want to connect with the commission. Their information is on our website, and I do encourage you to at least um, review and, and look at our agenda to see what's being discussed so you can be engaged. Uh, we are located inside City Hall, San Francisco. Uh, we're on the first floor within the tax office website, but we're totally separate from that. So uh, the idea is that people usually know that they need to come and, and register or do something at City Hall. So let's put us here at City Hall where we can also serve the people that might otherwise be coming into City Hall to register or pay their tax, et cetera. Uh, we also have now dedicated permit specialists staffed over at the permit center. Um, and these uh, permit specialists over at 49 South Van S, um, they will help with any kind of permitting needs. So if you are opening up a business that's going to require any particular type of permitting, whether it's building construction permitting, for doing alterations, remodeling, um, for establishing the use, uh, health permits if you're a cafe or restaurant, uh, our dedicated permit specialists over at the permit center will uh, are there to work with you and to help you through that process because it can be um, a tricky and sometimes uh, convoluted process. So now we have dedicated permit specialists there and um, there's going to be a slide to show you how you can connect with both of our teams here at City Hall and over at the permit center. We, again, like to consider ourselves the city's central point for all things small business. Um, we provide customized one-to-one -one business assistance, and I'll go over that a little bit more, but basically, we really kind of sit down with you when you come in, um, or when we talk, we'll get after, you know, kind of at what stage you're at with what you're doing, what is it that you're trying to do, what type of business are you trying to open, um, and then we will work from there to either guide you to additional resources or assistance, um, or to kind of lay out for you uh, the steps in the order uh, that you need to take to get registered, to get the proper permit, et cetera. So it's really customized to what you're doing and kind of like at what stage or app of what you're doing. Um, we, also, we provide services in English, Spanish, and Cantonese, and Mandarin um, directly uh, by staff at the office and other languages. Uh, we use language lines, language lines. So yeah, we try to make ourselves really accessible and available. Um, here's a slide that covers uh, some of the services that we offer. So again, we uh, provide information on starting a business in San Francisco. Uh, that includes like business formation and registration information and assistance. We also assist with the fictitious business name filing and operational permits and licenses. Um, we assist with zoning and land use information. And uh, we provide information about some important considerations that you need to be thinking about, particularly for those of you who might be looking to open a brick and mortar business, an actual storefront. Here in the city, we uh, provide information on small business accessibility. Uh, we also provide and connect you with business programs. Uh, so I like to say that we retail out information about various business programs uh, that are available from the city or otherwise. 
So that includes grant, loan, and right now we have a program called First Year Free, which I'll also cover in this presentation. Uh, we also connect you with um, business training and technical assistance providers and legal resources. So there are some things that we do not do in-house, um, and those things are we do not provide assistance with business plan development. Uh, we don't provide any kind of workshops or trainings ourselves, but rather we rely on our partner organizations, which there are several of them, and we'll have a slide um, that will show you all of our partner organizations at the end. Um, but so again, business planning, we do not assist with. We're also not lawyers nor tax professionals, so we cannot um, advise you or provide you legal advice. Um, so if you're needing someone to help review a lease, we would refer you out for that to our legal resources. Um, so those are the main things that we don't do. But otherwise, again, we like to be the first person that you come and then we can guide you. Uh, we also provide some general information on how to become a city vendor and um, getting certified as a local business enterprise, LBE certification. And then again, we also provide information on some of those labor laws, um, including workplace posters. Um, this is a slide on how and where you can contact us. This slide is also at the very end of my presentation. There's a lot of information here. The main thing is you can go to our website, which is right there on the left-hand side, sf.gov forward slash OSB. And you can see our different divisions, um, us at City Hall and our permit center team. Um, and then you can submit a question or schedule an in-person appointment right from our website. Uh, there's a link to schedule an appointment with us. And once you log in there or you click in that link, then you'll be directed to, do you want to schedule an appointment with the staff at City Hall for kind of general small business assistance, registration, or do you need specific special like permit assistance? And then therefore you can schedule an appointment with our uh, permit center team, permit specialist. Um, so that's that. And this slide is really just designed to give you a quick overview of um, the steps that you need to be considering and the order uh, in which you would do these um, when you're thinking of starting a business here in San Francisco. So one of the first things that we really try to push people to do is to take some business classes. Um, go and try to work on developing a business plan around your business idea. It's uh, something that we have found that when people take the time to really go and work on developing a business plan and taking classes, that they are ultimately going to be more successful in their business if they take the time to do that. And rather than just kind of like have somebody do it for you, you should actually do the work and understand what goes into the business plan um, and research specific for the type of business that you're looking to start, um, you know, marketing for that type of business, financing for that type of business. Those things are all part of a business plan. So again, we would connect you with our partner organizations that are set up to help you with that because again, we don't do that. Um, we also, uh, the second thing or one of the other things that you'll have to do um, up front is to select a business structure. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, also think about securing financing um, and filing your articles of organization if you're going to think about incorporating either an LLC or a corporation. You, need, you would then need to obtain your employer identification number and then register with San Francisco and then file a fictitious name. So this is kind of laid out in the order that you would do things depending on how you uh, ultimately structure your business, which we'll cover a little bit more again. Um, and then looking at op uh, obtaining operational permits and licenses, if applicable, not all, not all types of businesses will have additional operational permits and licenses. Um, and we'll talk about that again. And then making sure that you stay compliant, filing your taxes and uh, renewing your registrations, et cetera. We'll also talk about that a little bit more. So our next slide, um, as I mentioned, uh, one of the first things that you need to be thinking about when you think about starting a business, uh, particularly right before you think about registering, is you need to determine a business structure. So um, you might have heard of LLCs, limited liability companies, corporations, a sole proprietor, general partnership. Um, here on the right, you will see a, a comparison table of the different types of, these are like the most common types of business structures that we encounter and characteristics for each of them. 
Um, there's also resources here on the left-hand side on how you can uh, choose the best business structure for your particular type of business. It is something that we do encourage that you uh, consult with either a business lawyer and or a tax professional like a CPA uh, because ultimately um, this decision can, you know, make a difference in terms of how you file your taxes um, and where you need to begin to register. So um, generally, uh, the more risk involved in the business that you're getting into and the more uh, that you have to lose. So if, for example, if you have assets like a home, for example, and the business that you're getting into is, is very risky, then you may not want to consider the sole proprietor Ship, you might want to consider the two on the right, which is the small corporation or the limited liability company. Both of those provide a separation between you and your business um, so that you're not personally liable. That's the main difference between the sole proprietorship, general partnership, and the corporations and LLC. Um, however, that's not always necessary. I always like to tell people not all businesses are created the same. And what might work for one business doesn't mean that that's necessary for your business. We get a lot of people that come into our office, it's particularly right now, um, because uh, there is a, a fee waiver for creating a corporation and an LLC at the moment. Um, or we get a lot of people who say, oh, my friend has an LLC, I want to form an LLC, or somebody told me to create an LLC. Um, but when we start talking to them a little bit, we determine or we find out that really what they're doing is there's not a lot of risk involved and they really have nothing to lose. And maybe those types of entities are not necessary at the stage because they're just getting started. Um, what I will say is, again, we don't provide legal or tax advice. So this is pretty much the extent of the conversation that we would have with you. If you were to come in and weren't sure, uh, we would suggest that you go and get some of that consultation and again the legal services for entrepreneurs um, or these lawyers uh these free legal leads they're free is what i want to say so um legal services for entrepreneurs provides free legal uh assistance if you qualify based on income so what i would encourage you to do is to visit our website um we can share these slides at the end later and so these slides you should be able to click and it'll take you to their website. Otherwise, if you just Google legal services for entrepreneurs or on the internet, do a search, you should come to their website. They're also going to be listed on the last slide or the second to the last slide with their contact information. The SF Bar has a lawyer referral service for $35. They provide 30 minutes with the lawyer. And sometimes that's enough time to kind of make this determination. You can also get some additional information on sba.gov. Um, and San Francisco Public Library, Sports Floor, I believe it's their small business office. They have this kind of information and you can do a lot of research there. But um, ultimately, yes, this is something that you want to research. Depends again on your type of business and your specific financial situation. Um, a sole proprietorship is definitely easier, easier to get started and to get registered and only requires that you register at the local level. Whereas an LLC, limited liability company, or a corporation or corporation, all of those. Um, you need to think of these this entities, the LLC and the corporation, almost like a separate legal entity, separate from yourself, kind of almost like a person. You might have actually um, have heard of corporations referred to as people. I do like to kind of put it that way because it's easier to kind of grasp. But um, basically, it's going to be a separate person, separate from you. Um, and because of that, it has to be formed. So you, uh, you do that by filing with the California Secretary of State. You create this separate entity and add its own legal name. And similar to how we individuals have our own legal name, and then we can have a social security number, these entities um, will also request a tax number to identify them for tax purposes. So uh, there is an order. Um, I think now I will go ahead and, and go to the next slide, which um, is uh, our checklist. So if you were to come in to our office, we would sit down with you and we would pull out the checklist and we will kind of go over it with you based on our discussion with you. If you um, 
come in and you've told us, you know, you've already consulted with a lawyer or you've already done your research and you have determined that you want to form an LLC or a corporation, then we would identify that the first step um, on this checklist for you is to create your entity if you haven't done so already. Um, and I say that because there are services and we see a lot of people come in who have already paid a company online to uh, create their LLC or their corporation. Um, so if you've done that, then we'll kind of you know discuss that with you. Uh, you might already have some of these things and then we'll proceed to the next step. But if you have not, then your first step would be to uh, form that entity. Um, again, think of it as another person. So you're gonna create that person by filing what we call articles of organization, that's for the LLC, or articles of incorporation, that's for the corporation. Um, you do that online through the California Secretary of State website, and I'll have uh, more slides on that later. Uh, but essentially, that's where you begin on this checklist. Once you've done that, and like I mentioned before, these entities, um, because they're like a person, will need to have their, their own tax number. So then the next step and the next box on this checklist on the left, uh, which actually ends up being like the third box, um, says tax ID EIN number. So the next step would be to obtain that EIN number, that tax number for your corporation or LLC. And that is something that you do by um, going online to the IRS website and requesting that EIN number. This is generally free and generally obtained right away online. Once you have that, um, then um, anyone who operates in San Francisco, whether they are an individual sole proprietor, a general partnership, two people or more, or these uh, corporations or LLCs, when they operate in San Francisco, generally seven or more days, you are required to be registered with San Francisco as a business. So that would be the next step, the San Francisco business registration. And we'll have a slide on that process as well. Um, and then if um, you do business under a different name other than the um, owner's name, so if you're operating as a sole proprietor, your business registration is going to be under your name, your legal name. Or if you're operating as a corporation or an LLC, uh, the registration will be filed under that corporation or LLC name. But uh, you can also choose to do business under a different name. So if I'm operating as a sole proprietor and I'm going to have a flower shop and I want the shop name to be Sunshine Flowers or something like that. That's a name that's different than my legal name. In that case, it's considered to be fictitious, not my legal name. Same is true if I've created an LLC and I've called my LLC maybe like Yanis LLC or um, Flowers Are Us LLC, but then my shop name is called Sunshine Flowers. Again, it's a different name then the entity name as filed with the state, therefore is considered fictitious and I would need to file a fictitious business name statement. This is also known as a DBA, doing business as. And so that's another step um, and that happens with the county clerk's office. Um, and then beneath the fictitious name box here on the left, you will see where it says additional permits and licenses. Um, some businesses will have additional permits and licenses that they will need to obtain. These are um, operational permits usually that um, regulate the type of business activity that is being conducted. Um, again, not all businesses have additional operational permits, uh, but one clear example that I like to use a lot is a cafe or any type of food business. If they're selling food, then there is some sort of a health permit that you would need either from our local health department or the state health department. Um, so in addition to possibly all these things on the left-hand side, you know, maybe you formed your entity, your LLC, you've obtained your EIN number, you have registered your LLC to do business in San Francisco with, by filing your San Francisco business registration, and you file a fictitious business name. If you um, are a cafe or selling food, you might also need a health permit from the health department. So here on the right-hand side of this checklist, we have some of our um, 
local departments, and this might be a little bit hard to see, but again, we can share this out later. Uh, we've identified here uh, some of our more common uh, city departments and agencies and some state and federal departments and agencies that you might also need to engage with depending on your business activities. So um, let's see if I can actually zoom in on the um, but so again, in that example of the cafe, we have here the San Francisco Health Department. If you can see it, um, you would need to additionally obtain a permit from them. And then because you are selling goods under the state column, you would also need a California um, seller's permit. It's called seller's permit. And that's through the California Department of Tax and State Administration. Um, so again, what we do, part of what we do is we would sit down with you when you come in, we would uh, pull out this checklist, we would have a conversation with you about what it is that you're trying to do, um, and we would go through the checklist and mark it up for you uh, based on that discussion conversation. So that is to kind of give you a sense of what we do. Uh, so going forward, the next slide will really get into um, the steps in the process to organizing um, a corporation or an LLC if you're going that route. Uh, but again, ultimately something you'll want to discuss with a lawyer or a tax professional. So uh, we also, uh, one thing I will say, we don't have a referral for a tax professional, unfortunately. Um, so that might be something that you might need to find on your own. Ideally, you would want to talk to like the CPA uh, <clears throat> as opposed to, we have a lot of folks who sometimes will use a notary public to file their taxes, we encourage you to really talk to a, a tax professional, CPA, um, when you are deciding on your business structure. And um, so this is a slide that kind of provides you a brief overview of um, creating uh, or organizing an LLC or a corporation. So on the left, you'll have the limited liability company, uh, LLCs also, this is something that um, we cannot assist you with, so, but it's something that you should know. Uh, LLCs are, should have something called an LLC operating agreement. This is kind of like a document that, um, that says how the LLC will be managed and governed. Um, it doesn't need to be turned in anywhere. It's rather something that you would have on hand um, for yourself, particularly if there's going to be two or more of you that are going to be um, owners or what they, owners of an LLC are considered members. So um, you should definitely have a written operating agreement um, that kind of details things like how the LLC be managed. Uh, if one member wants out, what does that process look like? Or if you want to bring in other members, kind of what does that look like? Uh, we, while we can help you initially kind of just create the LLC, or corporation through our office. Uh, we do not assist with the operating agreement or corporation has something similar called uh, corporate bylaws. These are actual uh, documents that, again, say how your corporation is gonna be managed and governed. Um, and that is something that you'll usually want to have a lawyer assist you with. So again, referring back to our legal resources, that is something that potentially they can help you with. Uh, for those of you who might be interested in hiring or going with one of those online services that uh, that you pay for to create these entities, they will often, um, part of what you're paying for is, is those um, documents as well. So usually they will set up your LLC and then they also might create your uh, LLC operating agreement or corporate bylaws. Um, but usually those services don't do the local filing. So you really want to know if you're going to go that route, what it is that you're paying for. Um, and um, this is something that you can do yourself. So you don't necessarily need to hire these folks, but um, if you don't, then you will need to consult with a lawyer through either one of our free legal resources or low cost legal, legal resources to assist you with the operating agreement corporate bylaws. And by the way, uh, for both of these, you can also do an internet search to just even get like a draft or understand what is an LLC operating agreement, what is in 
an LLC operating agreement and you can get a lot more details and start putting something together. Uh, you might even find templates um, and that will be helpful for you if you can put something together, even a draft for when you do go and speak to a lawyer, you have at least something to show you that they can kind of look over for you. Same goes for the corporate bylaws. There's a lot of information you can receive online. Um, by doing searches, uh, go definitely take advantage of the library. They have, I'm sure, a lot of information on all of this as well. But um, ultimately, to create or file uh, the articles of organization or the articles of incorporation, you would do that at the California Secretary of State website. Um, and the website's listed there. Within 90 days of filing your uh, original articles, um, you also you have to log back in basically to the Secretary of State website and file, file something else called a statement of information. And um, again, right now, the fee for the filing of the original articles of organization or articles of incorporation that's being waived for LLCs and corporations that organized between January 1st, 2021 and before January 1st, 2024. Um, but the statement of information that has to be filed within 90 days, that is something that you will need to pay for. So that's $20 for the LLC, $25 for the corporation. So usually what will happen is you go on the Secretary of State website, you'll create a login or log on, and you'll file your articles. And then you should receive an email from the Secretary of State after about eight days. Processing time can vary depending on how busy they are, but lately it's been about eight days that it takes the state to file your articles. You will then be notified, or you can also go on the website and search and see if your articles have been filed. Um, but once you see that your articles have been filed or you receive the email from the state that your articles have been filed, then you can log back in and file your statement of information. The statement of information is something that you will file every other year for LLCs and every year for corporations. Um, so again, there is more maintenance, more management with having one of these types of entities that you want to consider if you're just getting started, whether you're up for, you know, staying on top of these filings. Um, the other such filing is that these entities have to pay an annual tax to the franchise tax board of $800. And that's regardless of whether you make any money or you're actually operating or not. It's the simple fact that you have created this entity um, that will require you to pay this minimum $800 tax to the franchise tax board. So you will start to receive a lot of documentation from the franchise tax board, from the Secretary of State, uh, that you'll kind of need to know how to manage because we will not be able to assist you with that going forward. So um, I really like to, you know, encourage you to do your due diligence and determine if this is really the route that you need to take right now, or maybe it's something that you can look forward to in the future as your business grows. Um, you'll have to kind of determine that for yourself, again, based on what type of business you're starting, how much risk is involved, what you have to lose, um, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, next slide, I've just kind of provided a screenshot of kind of where you will go if you're gonna file this yourself and information that you'll need to file um, and just kind of show you uh, what you will see when you go to the Secretary of State website. You're gonna see this biz file online. You'll click there. If you don't have a, an account already, you have created an account, you'll see this, um, this uh, other photo on the bottom left. It has a little red arrow that's pointing to a login. And once you click on that login, you'll either be able to log in if you already have created the login, or you'll be able to sign up. And to sign up, you'll provide your email um, and a password, I believe. But essentially, once you're in here, uh, you'll see the, the form to file um, either the articles here, the um, articles of organization if it's an LLC, or the incorporation and the articles of incorporation. You'll see this here on the form, and that will open up basically the form. And here on the left hand side, this is an example of one for the LLC. Uh, you'll see on the left hand side all of the sections that need to be um, filled in. But I kind of, before we go through this, I want to go back up to this slide that kind of talks a little bit about 
what information will be needed to complete this form. So the LLC name for the LLC, um, you need to know that the LLC name must include an LLC ending. That could be simply LLC, it could be L period, L period, C period, it could be spelled out, limited liability company, that's up to you. Um, but it does have to have one of those endings. And that full name is the legal name. So again, in my example, if I want to open up a, a flower store and I'm going to create an LLC because let's say um, I have a home and well, there's probably not a lot of bricks and flowers, but uh, let's just go with it. I, I want to create an LLC. Um, I'm going to name my LLC Sunshine Flowers LLC. Um, that's the legal name. But then if I name my shop just Sunshine Flowers without the LLC ending, because typically we don't see like LLCs when you think about a storefront. Um, so that means that I am doing business under a fictitious name. If I do that, but again, my legal name is Sunshine Flowers LLC in that example. And so you need to make sure that there's an LLC ending. You also will need your LLC address. You will need um, something called an agent for service of process. This is generally or typically a California resident. You could be yourself. Um, but this person is listed here as a person who can receive uh, legal documentation in case the LLC is sued. Um, so an agent for service of process. Some uh, people who use some of those services to create these, um, the LLC or the corporation, those um, service providers may also include as part of their fee and what you pay them, uh, a year's worth of, of providing that service for you where they list themselves or they list somebody else as the agent for service of process. But um, you can also be your own agent for service of process. So, you know, uh, you also will need to know the management structure of your LLC. Um, there is a question on the forum that asks, how will this LLC be managed? And your options are one manager, more than one manager, or all LLC members. Again, this is not something that we can advise you on. So this is something that you'll want to research up front. Um, again, by consulting with lawyers or doing your research um, at the library or, off, or online. Um, you know, what's the best management structure or different um, information on how to choose that. So um, what I can say is the manager doesn't necessarily need to be a member. Uh, a members, remember, are owners <coughs> of the LLC. That's what owners are referred to as members. So, but managers don't necessarily need to be uh, members. So that's something that you'll need to know when you're filling out the form. And then for corporations, very similar, you'll need your corporation name. Corporations um, often have an ink at the end of it, INC, um, but they're not required to. So whereas the LLC definitely has to have an LLC ending, the corporations um, can choose to have ink or don't have to have ink. That's kind of a preference, I guess, or up to you. Um, also, one thing I forgot to mention is before you go about forming your LLC, we do recommend that you first search um, for the name and make sure that you're not uh, filling out this form or a name that already exists. So on the same um, website, the Secretary of State website, uh, where you saw, uh, like here, if you'll look on the left-hand side, you'll see there's a search button. If you click on that search button, you'll be brought to a, a page where you can uh, input the name that you are considering for your LLC or corporation, and then um, click enter, and you'll get either a list of um, things that are very similar, or you will get no results. So you definitely do not want to register the same name. And I usually suggest stay away from anything that's too similar, especially if it's like the same type of business, which you may or may not know here, but you might need to Google it, um, that business to kind of see what type of line of, line of work they're in. But yeah, you want to stay away from anything that's exactly the same or too similar, especially if it's the same type of business activity and especially if it's in the same area. Um, but generally, but definitely the Secretary of State, if you file something um, that's the same or really, really similar, they may reject your, uh, your filing. 
So definitely search before you start going about these filings. Um, but kind of back to the information data for a corporation. So the corporate name, the corporate address, the agent for service of process, all of that same. But then uh, the last thing is uh, also something that we won't be able to uh, assist you with, but you'll need to know the total number of shares the corporation is authorized to issue. So this is something, again, you'll want to consult with a business lawyer or a tax professional and see if they can help you make that determination. Um, I'm not actually sure how you make that determination, but um, you can also try to research it online, um, but that is something that you will need to know at the moment of filling out these forms. So I'm going to scroll forward. Um, this is uh, basically the, the form. There's this privacy warning. It basically says that none of this information is private, so there's that public database. Anybody can go to the Secretary of State website, search for a name, and find out who um, who has registered it. Uh, so you'll want to keep that in mind. Uh, then there's the submitter information on the left-hand side, bottom left. That's just who's submitting this form, usually yourself. Um, there's this notice about professional services. So there's some types of businesses. Uh, I think like architects and lawyers who cannot um, organized as an LLC. Again, remember this example, and this slide is for LLC. Uh, then the LLC name, sorry, here on the bottom right, LLC name, and it does not say here, unfortunately, that it needs to have the LLC ending. Oh no, it does, I think. Let's see. The proposed name will appear on the record of California Secretary of State exactly as entered, including the LLC identifier. So I think if you fail to put the LLC identifier, it'll be red and it won't let you go forward. So um, it needs to have that LLC ending, as I mentioned before. Uh, the next uh, slides are initial street address of principal office of LLC, initial mailing address of LLC, and an agent for service of process. Um, here on the top right is where you need to select your management structure. Um, and then that's pretty much it. So you'll pay, you'll submit, you'll pay, or there's no fee right now. Um, and then, like I said, you're supposed to receive an email from the Secretary of State when your articles have been filed. Uh, we've just been getting people who have filed and um, have not received an email, so they call us back. Uh, and so what you can do is, if it's been a week and you haven't received anything, you can also log in to the Secretary of State website and see for yourself. Um, by searching under the name of your LLC. And if it comes up, if it's been filed, you'll see it there. Um, and you can then go ahead and log in and submit that statement of information, which is that next um, step. So then the next slide has to do with obtaining an employer identification number, which again, if you think back to our checklist, the order that you would do things in, if you're gonna go the route of an LLC or corporation, then the next step after your entity has been organized or created essentially is to solicit this EIN number. So there's an employer identification number, also referred to as a federal employer identification number, FEIN. This is obtained from the IRS website directly. You can get this for free. Um, we see people sometimes pay for this. Uh, sometimes what may happen is you go on the IRS website, you may end up clicking on something where you get redirected somewhere else. So if at the end you're being charged for this, um, just know that you probably have ended up on some other site and you can just go right back onto irs.gov website and try it again. So uh, the best thing to do here is when you're on irs.gov website is um, in the search field, type in EIN. Hopefully you can see that, uh, then search, then you'll get this second picture here. Uh, that will say employer ID numbers, and there's one option that says apply for an employer identification number online. I'll circle that, you'll click there. Once you click there, you'll see this other um, picture or screen, and you'll want to click where it says apply online now. And then for this, the screenshots you're going to see are the, the sections of um, this form essentially are, are here. So one of the first things that you're going to be asked is what type of legal structure is applying for the EIN. So you will select accordingly. 
Uh, one thing that I will say is sole proprietors that do not have employees do not need an EIS. You can operate this with your social. However, um, sometimes if you are uh, doing work like as a freelance writer or as a freelance uh, independent contractor where someone is needing to pay you and they're asking you to fill out a W-9 form, I think is what it's called, uh, where you're having to provide your tax number on there. For sole proprietors, rather than putting your social, uh, especially if you're doing work for multiple people where you might need to fill out multiple of uh, these forms, and rather than have your social security number out there, uh, you can opt to get an EIN number from the IRS, even though technically it's not necessary, but that is a way that you can try to protect your social. Um, and so then you would select the appropriate type of structure. And uh, in this example, again, it's up to the LLC. So then uh, why is the LLC requesting an EIN? Uh, started a new business, et cetera. That's usually the one that we ch check. Um, and let's see the next step there, the next screen. Tell us more about the members of the LLC. So LLCs can be a one member, just yourself, which is called a single member LLC, or it can be a multi-member LLC, two or more members. Um, when, when it's a single member LLC for tax purposes, it gets defaulted and treated like a sole proprietor. So there's going to be, I think, a question here that asks, how you want to be treated for tax purposes. Um, but yeah, basically you'll select the number of members, you'll select the, the state that you organize in. Oh, one thing I want to mention with that is oftentimes we have LLCs or corporations that were incorporated out of state in another state, like Delaware or Nevada are a couple of popular states for corporations um, to organize in that usually have to do with some sort of a tax benefit or uh, I can't speak to that, but what I will say is if that's the case where you've organized out of state, you would still need to qualify your out of state entity to do business in California by going through the process of filing with the Secretary of State. Um, the EIN number is something that you probably already would have because that's a federal number and so you wouldn't need to get a new EIN in that case but you would need to uh, file paperwork with the California Secretary of State and you're still gonna be subject to our minimum $800 tax annually. So um, that's something that you'll wanna discuss down with a tax professional or a lawyer to help you determine whether it makes sense to file out of state or not. So what I understand, and again, I'm not a lawyer nor a tax professional, is that generally our larger corporations, those that do um, business throughout the US, are the ones that may file in um, another state, like Delaware, Oregon, Nevada. Uh, so these are like your Twitters of the world, Facebook, Chevron, larger corporations. But that's not to say that it's not a best choice for you, but definitely something that you'll want to consider or talk to, again, a tax professional or a lawyer. Um, so going forward, who is a responsible party? Of the LLC, you will select the individual. The next step, so the next question, you select an individual. Please tell us about the responsible party. And so, again, if it's just myself, or even if it's me and another um, member, I would put one person has to be a responsible party. So you put one of your uh, information there with your social, and then um, it will ask where the LLC is physically located. Um, and then it will ask you to tell them more about your LLC. This is where you would insert the name of your LLC as filed with the Secretary of State, again, including that LLC entity. And then it also is going to ask you if you have a trade name or if you're doing business under a different name. Um, you'll want to enter that there. And also, before you do that, there's, we recommend that you search um, for the name availability of any name that you're using, whether it's your LLC name or a trade name, DBA, fictitious name, all of those are basically mean the same thing. Fictitious name, DBA, trade name, that all means the same thing. And we certainly encourage you to search in a number of sources before you uh, decide uh, to move forward with any particular name. And uh, that's gonna be another screen, I think, um, 
all the websites where you can search. Um, but then, again, state territory or articles have been filed, and then your uh, start date, the month that you filed. Um, over here, some additional information is what does your business or organization do? So there's a list of business uh, types here on the left. If you don't clearly see your type in one of those, there is this um, option of other at the very bottom. And if you choose other, I think there's another screen that I may have not included here where you get to indicate what it is. And so I think there's like services is another um, option under other. And you can actually even type in um, what type of service. So I think I missed a couple screens. But um, then uh, here, tell us more about the LLC. Uh, there's a few questions. Typically, these don't apply to a lot of businesses, but it all depends what you're doing. So uh, you can always click on those links to read a little bit more about what those mean and answer accordingly. And then you're going to get to this almost last step where you're going to be asked how you want to receive your EIN letter. And we recommend that you choose that first option, receive letter online, because uh, it will give you the PDF basically right there. And you can print out or save it, download it, um, versus receiving it by mail, which may take longer. Uh, one thing that I also want to go back to for this responsible party, if it's um, someone who does not have a social security number, maybe you have the ITIN number, that's an individual taxpayer ID number, it likely will not allow you to obtain this EIN through this online form. Um, you could try it, but usually we see that people with ITIN get an error message saying that um, they can't get it. And in that case, they would have to submit a, a form, a paper form via fax to the IRS. And it can take a little longer. Um, sometimes it's taken up even up to two months. So be mindful of that. But otherwise, you'll, you should then receive your EIN letter. Um, and you'll have that number. And so then after you have that number, if you think back on our checklist in the order that we do things, um, your next step is to register with San Francisco. So this is information about our San Francisco business registration. Um, so San Francisco's business tax regulations code generally requires that every person or entity engaging in business within the city for any part of seven or more days in a year must register. Um, and you generally have 15 days from the date that you begin to come in and get registered. Um, so a lot of times you get people ask, like, how quickly can I start once I register? You can start right away. And you'll actually, um, yeah, and they give you that 15 window period, 15 day window period to, to come in and get registered. Uh, anything dated, uh, so the application is going to have a question about the start date of San Francisco. And if you backdate it more than 15 days, uh, you will be penalized because you should have registered within 15 days. Um, so keep that in mind. The city, we operate on a fiscal calendar. So our year runs from July 1st through June 30th. So we, got, we are right now towards the end of our year. If you are registering at this time, you um, will pay for the current registration year and you'll also be billed for the upcoming year that begins July 1st. So to the extent that you can wait, to begin your business um, until July 1st, you might want to consider that. Otherwise, know that you will be paying for two years, current year and the upcoming year. Um, so I think that's what the third bullet point says. If you've been registered, they're generally valid for one year. However, for businesses registering after the beginning of the fiscal year and even up to like June 30th, if you want to come in and fill out that registration on June 30th, you're going to be charged for a whole year um, for that one day. So keep that in mind. We get a lot of people who come in and register now, or, um, or maybe they did the registration themselves, but then uh, now we're receiving notices to renew. So our renewal is always in May, and it has to be renewed by the last day of May. Um, so yeah, sometimes people get confused with that. They'll say like, oh, so I have to pay like every two months or every three months, depending on when they did it. And we have to tell them, no, it's just that you came in later in the year, and so it wasn't valid for very long. But now, once you renew in May, it'll be valid for a full year. And you won't have to renew until next May. Um, fees are based on the start date. Um, business activities, and there's going to be a section on the application that asks you to list or note your business activities. 
and it's also the fee is based on estimated gross receipts. So you're going to be asked on the application to estimate your gross receipts for the current calendar year. Um, and there's a fee schedule I'll show you. Um, a business registration is not a business permit or a license. Some businesses will additionally need business licenses or operational permits. Um, and they may also need to file and pay uh, business taxes. Uh, but we do have a small business exemption from our San Francisco County general business tax. So this, what we're talking about right now, is the San Francisco business registration. Everyone that does business in San Francisco needs to have this, but not everybody will pay San Francisco's business tax. And I'll talk about that more in a, in a later slide. Excuse me. Um, so this is a little bit more, this slide is a little bit more information about the business registration, San Francisco business registration. Basically, if any of these items are true on the left-hand side, um, that is who is required to register. We get a lot of questions about this often. Um, so it's generally, again, anyone doing business here, uh, or another example I like to give is if there's a company that um, is not based here, necessarily, maybe they're based in LA or New York, but if they have employees, working remotely from their residence for that company in San Francisco, then that company um, that's based outside of San Francisco has what we call nexus in San Francisco and therefore would need to register with us as well. And that would be uh, like a W-2 employee that might be working for that company here, which we're seeing, you know, obviously with pandemic, we saw a lot more of that, people working remotely, um, any place really, so um, keep that in mind that this is uh, another, yeah, basically a list of who needs to be registered here. And then on the right-hand side is the fee schedule. So you'll see the two different fee schedules. Uh, there's only three types of businesses that will fall under Schedule B. Those are retail, wholesale, and something called certain services. So retail, wholesale, and certain services. And you'll see when we see the screenshots of the application, um, the list and where you might fall into. Um, and also if, if you do select multiple types of business activities and they fall in both schedule A and schedule B, the fee will default to the higher amount. And so <clears throat> again, uh, you will have to estimate your gross receipts. And so if you're estimating gross receipts for anywhere between zero and 100,000 and your fee is the minimum amount, which is either 54 or 44 plus a four dollar state fee. And that's how the fee is determined. Um, the fee schedule has gone up slightly for the new year. That will begin July 1st. And there's another uh, slide that shows that. But here's another slide that talks about the business registration. And when you go to this website that's highlighted here in yellow, that's where you would find the new business registration application. So you would click on this new business registration application. There's also some other information down here that you can review. But basically, uh, you'll click on that new business registration application. You'll complete these sections of the application. Then you will um, submit it. Once you submit it, you'll receive an uh, email to DocuSign the application. And then once you DocuSign the application, you'll receive another email to pay the registration fee. Uh, so something to note on filling out this uh, application, something to note, I should say, is you will need your tax ID number. So again, that's either gonna be your social security number if you're uh, gonna be filing as an individual sole proprietor, um, or it's gonna be, or your ITIN if you don't have a social and you're an individual, um, or it's gonna be an EIN, that EIN number from the IRS. That goes for general partnerships or LLCs or corporations. So you will need that number. You will also want to research the business name um, prior to completing this registration. So these are the three sites that we suggest that you search for business names. And this goes for also when you're thinking about a name for your LLC or corporation. Uh, you want to search all these databases. Again, these, uh, this search, is largely for you to determine how comfortable you are going forward with the name that you have selected or uh, kind of knowing what's out there, right? And so again, 
stay away from anything exactly the same or too similar, particularly if it's the same line of business, same activities in the same or general area that you're operating in. Um, in, let's see, in the business identification section of the application, like I said, there's several sections of the application. We'll look at that. But there's this one section called business identification, and it says business name. So a lot of people enter their business name there. But in fact, um, if you're a sole proprietor or a general partner, you should be listing the individual's first and last name here. Um, otherwise, LLCs and corporations will list the, the LLC or corporation name as filed on its articles of organization or articles of incorporation. This is one thing where I see a lot of people um, mess up because um, they list the business name here because it says business name. So this application is not very intuitive, but this is why I'm making these notes. Um, and if you ever have questions again, just give us a call. Uh, most, there's a question or a section on taxes and fees on this application. And most of those don't apply to most of the businesses that we see come through our office, most small businesses. But if you have questions, let us know. Uh, and then within five to 10 days after you um, pay, you will receive the certificate if that's mail to your mailing address on record. Uh, and you will also receive a letter from the Office of the Treasurer Tax Collector. And that letter will have a unique eight character pin printed on it. You'll want to keep that letter safe because you'll, you will need to refer to that eight character um, pin in the future when it's time to renew. Um, or if you want to make updates to your account, like change your mailing address, et cetera. So keep that letter handy. Otherwise, you might need to request that your pin be reset. So during this renewal period, we get a lot of calls from people saying, I don't have my pin, where can I find it? Um, and so again, it's gonna be printed on that letter. Every May, when it's time to renew, you should also receive a notice to renew and that pin will also be printed there, but it's not something that you're gonna get via email. Um, it's uh, printed on a letter. So keep that uh, when you receive that. Uh, going forward, these are the screenshots of the, um, of the application that you're going to see when you go when you click on that new business registration application. The first question again, and this happens um, with most applications that you're going to be filling out uh, that have to do with the business. One of the first things you're going to be asked is what's the structure, who's applying, and so in this case, what is the organization type of this business? And you'll see this drop down menu. These are the options that you have to choose from. So um, you'll either you'll select the appropriate one. We get oftentimes people who select LLC, but they haven't actually formed their LLC yet. So you want to make sure that you don't do that. You want to make sure that you are selecting however you are going to be um, operating. So if uh, I think in this example, I also stuck to LLC. So on the right top hand side, you'll see that business identification section that I was talking about, um, where it says business name. And this is, it says right under that, as shown on your income tax return. So again, because you need to think of LLC as a separate person or entity that's going to be filing its own tax return, it would be that name complete with that LLC identifier at the end. And to the right of that, the tax ID number will be that EIN that the LLC obtained uh, from the IRS for the LLC. Um, in contrast, if it's a sole proprietor, under business name, and if you're doing sole proprietorship in that where it's parentheses where it says as shown on your tax, the tax return, when it's a sole proprietor, you will actually see it says sole proprietor, enter first and last name in red letters because oftentimes people are just putting their business name here. So sole proprietor here will enter their first and last name and their social to the right. Um, then business start date in San Francisco. Again, if that's more than 15 days past um, backdated, then the, uh, know that you will be charged the late filing penalty. Uh, your telephone number, your business email address, you confirm your business email address. There's a question here, are you establishing this business to be a vendor with the city? Mostly this is so, so it's defaulted to no. That's not to say you cannot later decide you want to sell to the city, but most people are not setting this up because they're doing that. And in fact, if you say yes, I think it'll pop up another box where you could have to provide your supplier number. Um, and then it, uh, there was a time when the tax office was noticing, sending notices to people that weren't registered. 
that they needed to maybe get registered. So this next question, if you received a letter from the office, Treasury Tax Collector, instructing you to register, there was a correspondence number. So this is left blank for a lot of you folks. Um, the tax office does that from time to time, but um, otherwise it's left blank. A business mailing address, the next section. You might, um, when you put in your business mailing address, or yeah, mailing address, you might receive a pop-up um, or like red text that kind of indicates like maybe the the address is not correct. Usually, again, just double check it. If it looks correct, you can click continue and it should allow you to move forward. So, um, so then the next section, oh yeah, here is an example of this. We are unable to validate our mailing address against the US Postal Service, but again, if I review it and it all looks good, um, it can continue and it should allow you to move forward. Then the next step is change of ownership. Um, is this a change of ownership from an existing business? Yes or no? And then owner's details. So in the case of an LLC, you're gonna go ahead and just copy from business identification page. It's gonna copy the LLC name and your EIN. Uh, but otherwise, so here, if you read, it says for owners that are general partnership, not registered with the Secretary of State, list the full names of all partners. Um, for a trust, list the trustee as the owner for all other owners that are entities, provide the entity name. So that's why you would just copy. But if it's a sole proprietor or a partnership, you would put the individual's uh, information here again, which might be the same as the copy from the identification page. Owner's address, um, and then over here, if, when it's an LLC, you'll get this uh, box on the bottom left that says business officers. So you'll enter in your the officers or members. Uh, in this case, like I said, LLC owners are called members. So I filled this out with my name. My title is member, and you might say CEO. Depends how you um, noted it when you registered with the state. Uh, my phone number, my email, add officer. So you have to click on where it says add officer to actually add me uh, or add yourself. And then if there's multiple, you'll click on add officer again. Um, then if you're on the right hand side, you have the identification of business activities. Um, everything should fall into one of these activities. If you're not sure, there is a website that you can search um, for your code and you'll be looking to match like the first two numbers. To, so you'll see where it says accommodations and it's a range between 7210 to 7219. You're usually looking at matching those first two numbers. So the website where you can go to to check um, if you don't clearly see your activity listed here is um, www.nancyaicf, as in Nancy America I Igloo. Uh, N A I C California S Sam N A I C S dot com, or actually even just do an internet search. Maybe so, like let's say I'm doing consulting, and I don't see consulting on this list. I can just type in consulting comma N A I C S code, and it'll bring up a code and um, tell me that consulting generally falls into number fourteen professional, scientific, and technical services. Otherwise, you can always use the activity not listed above, but that's going to default to the higher amount. But again, the, the only three uh, business activities that fall into the lesser amount uh, fee schedule are number five, this is one called certain services, number uh, 16, retail trade, and number 19, wholesale trade. Everything else is under Schedule A. Then it will ask, are all of your business activities fully within San Francisco? Yes or no. Uh, then it will ask you to, oh, uh, what is the average number of employees per week, including those outside of San Francisco? What is the estimated San Francisco payroll expense? Uh, what is the estimated San Francisco gross receipts? And again, based on this question, number three is how they determine the fee. Remember, so anything between zero and 100,000 is going to default the first uh, minimum amount. Uh, all the other fees on that fee schedule that are, that are not within that first minimum amount um, will be prorated at this point. Um, so you can only pay 25% of the fee um, at this moment, but you'll pay that for a current year and 
just know that you're already being filled within an upcoming year. But you do have until the 31st of May to pay for the upcoming year. Uh, then number question number four, does this business have taxable business personal property in San Francisco? This is um, any equipment, fixtures, supplies that you might have, machinery um, in your business. So again, in my example of a flower shop, it's everything inside my flower shop. So it's any tables that I use to make flower arrangements on, any refrigerator that I might have, is a cash register, anything that's inside my shop that's not for sale is considered business personal property. So not the real estate, but everything inside. Um, what this question is asked for is to determine whether you may be subject to that um, that tax or that filing. So this is another tax, it's a state tax. Uh, this is state constitution, but it's um, assessed through our local assessor recorder's office. So annually they send out notifications to businesses to itemize and report all of their business property and they have to value it and they pay a tax based on that. Um, value of their business property. So this initial question here is to determine whether the whether you might be receiving that uh, additional paperwork to report and file business personal property tax. So when you say yes, here the idea is that the tax office is supposed to share this information with the assessor's office, and the assessor's office then know to mail you information about that filing. Uh, there is a small business deduction with respect to that tax that will exempt uh, businesses whose property values are under $4,000. So if you're working, um, you're running a business, maybe by consulting example, I'm doing consulting, but really I just operate out of my home. I just have my computer, my desk, or maybe I use my kitchen table, my phone, that's probably less than $4,000. So I won't be subject to that tax. Um, but I might still need to say yes here. And then just know that when you receive that documentation about that filing, you can report and it will be the low value threshold and therefore you won't be subject to the actual tax. Um, the next question, does this business receive rental income for four or more residential units in one building? Yes or no, that's usually no for a lot of the people that we assist. Um, is this business subject to cannabis tax? Again, just depends on what you're doing. Uh, but usually no for a lot of our clients. Uh, if this business is exempt from paying the registration fee, usually the only types of businesses that are exempt from paying the registration fee are generally nonprofit organizations, um, but also um, family child care centers are exempt. Um, and they would need to upload a copy of their state child care license, just as an FYI. Uh, then there's these sections about these taxes and fees. Again, most of these do not apply to most of the businesses that we are assisting. Um, these are for these utility companies themselves. So you can usually say no to all of this, but if you have questions, let us know. Then this next section, location details. Um, here is where you would put the name, the business name, the CBA or fictitious name that you want to do business under. So it's not very intuitive because they call it location detail and location trade name. But um, this is where you would put your DBA doing business as, also known as fictitious business name, SBN, trade name, et cetera. Uh, and again, you just want to search for it first. Then you're, once you're comfortable with it, you would note it here. Um, location start date. Then there is this question that asks, is this a commercial use location in San Francisco? So basically anything that's non-residential is commercial. Um, and the reason that they're asking this right now is that we do have a program um, to waive businesses, new businesses, um, or new locations of existing businesses that are commercial, their first year fee. So including their first year registration fee, but also if any of them would have additional permits that they might need to obtain the city, whether it's a health permit or a building permit for remodeling, those um, fees are all waived for commercial uses in San Francisco, uh, for commercial locations. So that's why they're asking that. Location address, this is the address where the business is actually located. Um, so for many who might operate from home, that might be your home address. For those of you that will be opening up, 
uh, storefront or something like that, it would be that address that you would put here. <clears throat> this is another question about some other taxes and fees. Uh, typically, those don't apply, but if you are doing short term rentals like Airbnb, then you would say yes to that first one. Or if you're a parking lot operator or a um, or a hotel operator, then you might say yes to the transient or to the parking. If you um, are selling cigarettes, you might say yes to that. And if you are selling sugary drinks like sodas and other sugary beverages, and you're purchasing those beverages from outside of San Francisco, then you would say yes. Otherwise, if you purchase all those sugary drinks from within San Francisco, you are already paying that sugary drink tax. So you could say no in that case. Uh, location details. Then basically that's it. You'll review, you'll submit, you'll receive an email to sign, then you'll receive another email to pay. This, uh, I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm going to kind of go a little bit faster here, but uh, this is a slide that talks a little bit about the business taxes. So we have a general uh, San Francisco business tax, the first one, but it generally exacts a small businesses that gross under $2,090,000. So um, if you gross over that, you might need to pay some of these taxes. Generally, um, anything under that, you will be exempt as a small business and you won't be subject to our business tax. Uh, we also have that business property tax, which I had mentioned. This is in the state constitution, so you will find this anywhere in California that you go to, but items like furniture, machinery, and equipment used to run a business are subject to property tax. This is personal property must be reported to the assessor's office and valued annually for property tax purposes. Generally, property value under four thousand is exempt, but otherwise the tax rate fluctuates annually, currently about one point one seven nine seven percent. And then we have third-party taxes, or what we call special third-party taxes. These are certain, um, these apply to certain businesses, so like the hotel operators, the parking lot operators. They are required to collect the tax from the customer client um, and they're going to report that and pay that to the city. Um, so that's that. So for instance, the sugary drink tax too. If you are purchasing your sugary beverages from outside of the city and not already paying that tax, then it's up to you as someone in San Francisco that's going to be selling sugary drinks, so like our cafes, our markets, any of those that might be purchasing outside of the city will be responsible for collecting um, that tax and paying and reporting and paying that tax to the city. So keep that in mind. Um, this is taxes. This is a slide on business registration renewal, which again is due by the end of this month. So for any of you who are on here that might already be registered, you should have already received a notice from the Office of the Treasurer Tax Collector reminding you to renew. You do have until the 31st to renew. If you're going to be closing your business, you have until June 30th to close the business, but otherwise you will want to renew. And this is the link that you'll go to. This is the information that you'll need to complete your renewal. Again, you will need that online PIN, which is found in a prior renewal notice or in a letter that you received from the tax office from when you first registered if you kept that. If you do not have it, you can request a new PIN. Um, it'll reset it and it will be mailed the PIN to your mailing address on record. So you want to make sure that your mailing address is current. Um, if you're a sole proprietor, then you can come into City Hall and get that PIN um, in person on the spot. You will need to bring ID, but only sole proprietors are able to get the PIN on the spot. All other types of entities will need to um, fill in this request to PIN and then wait for it to be mailed to you, which can take about five days. So definitely don't wait for the last minute if you cannot locate your PIN. Um, you'll need to report your 2022 taxable San Francisco gross receipts. And then here on the right is our new fee schedule for the new year. Um, so again, depending on your gross receipts, the fees went up slightly, a couple dollars, not much. Um, that's the renewal slide. This is oh, where you go. So after you register, um, you may need to file a fictitious business name if that's applicable to you. So if you're doing business under a different name than the legal name of the owner or entity, you would, again, want to search all these sites before you start filling some of these forms out. But after you register, and only after you register, 
you would then have to file a fictitious business name statement form. And that gets filed with the county clerk of the county where you have your principal place of business. So if you are here in San Francisco, then that's here with San Francisco uh, County Clerk's Office. But we have a lot of times people that operate in San Francisco that are not based here. So we might have caterers or construction companies that are based outside of the city, but they come into San Francisco to do work. So they need to be registered with us, but their fictitious name needs to be filed in the county where they are based out of. So um, this is a slide that talks about that. The fee is $60. For one uh, registrant, essentially one person or one entity doing business under one name, and then they charge additional for each additional person or each additional name. And then part of the filing of a petition name requires that you publish the name in a newspaper. And so um, that has to be published in the paper one day a week for four consecutive weeks. At the end of the fourth week, you're going to file proof back with the county clerk's office that that was done. Some of the publications do that for you. You'll want to double check. This is a slide that shows where you search for the name, what you're going to see, what it, what it looks like when you go to these sites to search. Um, I'm sorry, I'm rushing through this. We're running out of time. Uh, fictitious business name, this is what the form looks like. This has to be done in person or by mail. Uh, so best to do in person is uh, automatic. Please note that their office closes at 4 p.m., so they stop at 50 people by 4. So you want to make sure that you're here sooner than that. And this is the list of publications that you can choose from. This is a little bit of information about that, but basically, again, the name has to appear in one of these publications one day a week for four consecutive weeks. And at the end of the fourth week, there has to be proof filed back with the county clerk's office that that was done. So uh, here we've given you a range of their fees. We recommend going with one that says filing fee included because basically that will take care of that full filing for you. So one day a week, four weeks, and a proof um, filed on your behalf. This is a slide that shows um, some of our additional agencies, uh, a little bit yeah, bigger. So like I mentioned earlier, the health department, if you are selling food, you would additionally need a health permit from them. Um, the seller's permit from the state over here on our state on the right. This is just a, a visual of some of our additional uh, departments and some of the permits that they administer. So when in doubt, just give us a call, come in, and we'll, we'll tell you exactly what's needed for what you're doing. Um, zoning and land use. So definitely before any of you who are thinking of opening up a storefront, a brick and mortar, you never, ever, ever want to sign a lease before you confirm that you can operate your particular type of business in that space that you have identified. So ideally, you're looking at places, you're taking down addresses, and then you're coming to the city. Um, our permit center staff over at our permit center, or permit specialist over at the permit center, who you want to contact in this space, uh, or just visit the permit center and the planning department also there. You would give them an address. You would tell them, I want to open up a cafe at this location. Can I, or what is required for me to do so? If it wasn't already a cafe or a restaurant, limited restaurant, then you might have to do something called a change of use or uh, conditional use. Uh, Prop H is a new program that helps uh, get through that building permit process faster. So take a look at that. Reach out to our permit specialist at the permit center. If this is something that you are looking to do and if you need help uh, confirming the zoning and understanding what's going to be required for you to locate somewhere. And don't, um, uh, I also say like, even if this business was already previously a cafe, if it's been closed, um, you want to, or just, it's just better to always double check. You never know under what conditions somebody else might've been operating previously. Maybe they didn't go through the proper channels and didn't get the proper approval. So always uh, double check and don't sign a lease before you confirm and you know and you understand the process that you will have to undergo to operate there. Sometimes it could be a long process um, and you want to be prepared for that because you might need to ask the landlord to give you six months free rent because this process is going to take that longer and longer. So um, definitely keep that in mind. Um, here is information about some uh, uh, resources around small business and accessibility. So we have a page on our website. The best thing to do is visit our website and review um, 
everything you need to know about ADA and small business. Uh, there is a requirement for commercial landlords to give you a notification, either telling you that the place has, is accessible or telling you that you might need to be responsible for making accessibility improvements to the space. Um, there's also the city program called Accessible Business Entrance Program that requires property owners to make their ground floor commercial entrances accessible, but not the full business. So uh, when you're a cafe or a salon, you also have to have a restroom that's available to your patrons. Um, and so you'll want to make sure that that's accessible. We do have a grant right now that uh, can help you pay for making your place more accessible. So I'm going to share the slide about our storefront improvement grants next. So we have the ADA grant. We have the, um, and then we have a couple of other grants. What is called, um, oh, this SF Shines, but within SF Shines, we have two. We have design services grant. And a construction grant. Each of these is uh, up to five thousand, whereas the ADA grant is up to ten thousand. And then we have a vandalism grant. I know I'm going through these really fast, but again, we'll be happy to share these slides later. Um, and or like I said, reach out to us directly. This is additional information about the first year free program. But again, the first year free generally applies to commercial uses, and it waives your initial uh, registration and initial like permit fees or um, so if you're a cafe you would waive your health permit application fee which is of course a 600 something dollars and it'll pay for your first year annual license fee which uh, depending on how big the cafe is could be thousand or more uh, and it'll also pay if you're doing remodeling uh, you generally anytime you're doing any kind of remodeling or construction or repairs you need building permits with the building department to do that work and so it'll waive those permit fees from the building department, including the sign permit, et cetera. So you have to register or add a new location by January 30th. It is um, set to sunset January 30th of this year. We are hoping that it might get extended, but as of now, um, you would have to register or add a new location by that date and apply for the permit by that date as well. Um, here are some additional business resources. We have our technical assistance provider. These are organizations that you can go to to get uh, entrepreneurship training, one-on-one -on -one assistance. We have our financing resources. Uh, these financing resources listed here, I will say, are considered alternative lenders for people who cannot get a bank loan. So if you're just starting a business, you're likely going to have trouble getting a bank loan. These might be your only option. Um, just expect that you will be um, paying a higher interest rate than what you can get through a bank. These are typically prime plus four uh, for the rates for these uh, financial resources. We do, though, right now have a, a loan through Main Street launch, the first one that's listed here. It's zero interest for startup businesses. So you can definitely reach out to them directly to inquire more about that. It's up to 100,000, zero interest um, uh, for startup businesses specifically. And then we have our legal resources down here. And then again, where to contact us. And I know we're at time, so I don't know if we still have time to take questions. Um, Christy, what do you say? Yeah, are you available for about five more minutes? I definitely am. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so I'll try to summarize some of these questions. Okay. Um, one person wondered if any of the partners that you mentioned, uh, resource partners, could advise on small business taxes. Um, so we do have an organization. I'll, I'll go back to that slide right here. Um, called San Francisco Small Business Development Center. It's right here on the left, towards the middle, bottom, middle. San Francisco Small Business Development Center. They have uh, professional business consultants that are available to meet with businesses for free. Um, I don't know if they have a tax professional um, on staff, but I do believe that they do have people who know about bookkeeping. Um, so that would be the one that I would probably suggest that folks reach out to uh, for that type of assistance. And um, if they have someone, they would pair you with them. Um, otherwise, like I said, they do offer some um, bookkeeping classes I know they have like an HR person, but I feel like our tax person is a little bit lacking. Like something that we have been telling 
um, folks that is needed. Uh, so may or may not be available, but if so, that would probably be the best organization to contact. Okay, thank you. Um, there were some comments and questions about the um, the, the waiver for the Secretary of State um, fee and then the $800 franchise tax board annual tax. Um, are those actually waived for new businesses? So yes, for new businesses that register between now and uh, before January 1st of 2024, your initial filing for your LLC and corporation is waived. So rather than paying the $70 for the LLC filing or $100 for the corporation, that will be waived right now. And the first annual um, $800 is waived as well. Uh, the one thing that I will note with that though is that the first year annual um, $800 for, a, for, for an LLC is generally due within the first four months of forming. So if you are organizing an LLC now in May, you'll count May, June, July, August. That first year fee is typically due in by August 15th, say first $800. So that is waived, but you will pay in April of next year your $800. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, someone asked a great question. What are some common painful mistakes that new owners make? I think um, definitely not working on a business plan, not um, consulting with lawyers or tax professionals to determine how best to structure their business. Um, we see a lot of times um, we're not operating in the right way. Like I said before, or sometimes people um, are organized one way with the state and then a different way with the city. Maybe initially they registered with us as a sole proprietor or a general partnership and then over time, they were advised, advised by their tax professional that maybe it made more sense for tax savings to incorporate. Uh, I just had this come up the other day where someone's been operating, um, well, they're registered with the state as a corporation and probably have been filing their taxes that way, but with the city, they're still uh, registered as a sole proprietor or general partner. And um, what happened during the pandemic when businesses that were in, in, in existence that was seeking funding from the government, oftentimes they were realizing that they had created an LLC, but they hadn't stayed on top of their filings. So therefore their LLC was no longer in good standing with the state because maybe they had failed to pay their $800 tax or they had failed to uh, file that statement of information that's due every other year. And so in order for them to get back in good standing with the state, they had to come up with those taxes while meanwhile they were looking to get help, right? Because they were suffering. And so some people lost out on being able to take advantage of the government help for businesses because they weren't um, they weren't filed correctly or they weren't on, on top of their, their filing. They had fallen out of good standing. So that's why I think it's really important to, from the get-go, try to understand what is the best structure for you. Um, talk, take advantage of these resources that are available. It's free, so definitely take advantage and, and get the, um, the training and the, the know-how under your belt before going forward. Okay, thanks. We have just time for one more question. Um, someone is selling items on Etsy. Does she need to register her business in San Francisco? Yeah, so if that person is running their business on Etsy and they are located in San Francisco, running that business from their computer um, at their home in San Francisco, then yes, that uh, that is considered having nexus in San Francisco and therefore uh, would need to be registered. Okay, great. Well, I don't want to keep you any longer, Martha. Your presentation was so great. It was super comprehensive. Um, yeah, I see that there are a lot of questions. I don't know if it's possible to get um, like the, the chat, and I can maybe try to reach out to some folks um, later. Is sure. doable? Yeah, of course. Or, um, or if you prefer, also, whoever has asked a question, um, you can also email me your question to. My email, so this is our contact, um, but my email is at the very front. So let me just share that screen again one more time. Right here down at the bottom, martha.yanis at sfgov.org. Um, email is going to be best because we have been uh, really busy 
and we are we have limited staff there's only like three of us and we're still working remotely two days out of the week so if you are a colleague definitely leave a message we are checking that and trying to get back to people if not same day next day uh but oftentimes we're at the counter with clients so if we're not paying up because of that uh, so email works great i'm often emailing people back late um so that i would just want to say that yeah be patient with that but we do try to get back to people by the next day Thank you for offering that. That's great. Um, so yeah, I'm going to include uh, Martha's slides and the recording in the follow-up email. And please do contact the Office of Small Business and also the library if you need any more help or have more questions. But I want to thank Martha so much for your time and expertise. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you all. And I hope you have a great rest of Small Business Week. Yes. Happy Small Business Week. Thank yeah. you so much.